Welcome to Chords, Arcs, and Central Angles. Our objectives today are to define and recognize a chord, an arc, and a central angle. Also to know the relationship between a central angle and its intercepted arc, as well as know the relationship created when a radius bisects a chord. Let's look at a central angle. A central angle of a circle is an angle of measure less than 180 degrees. Notice in this diagram here, here's our central angle. It has a vertex at the center of the circle and the sides are radii of the circle. In the diagram below, angle AOB is our central angle. Notice that AB then is the corresponding chord. A chord intersects a circle on the inside in two places. The longest chord in a circle passes right through the middle and that's a diameter. That turns the circle into two semicircles. We also have these arcs that are intercepted by our central angle. So, this first arc, AB, is a minor arc. It lies on the interior of the central angle. Notice up here in the description, arc AB, and I'm circling that, is usually notated by two letters if it's a minor arc less than 180 degrees. Then we have a little minor arc notation over the top. Now we also have a major arc in blue here and we usually notate that with three letters so that we know it's greater than 180 degrees. It's a major arc, A, D, B. Let's look at a quick example so we can understand the relationship between a central angle and its intercepted arc. Well, the relationship between the two is that they are the same. So, if the intercepted arc AB, which is a minor arc, is 80 degrees, then so is that central angle. Let's look at another example. Suppose in this diagram above, the measure of angle, and notice it's angle because you can see the little angle marks. So the measure of angle AOB is 160 degrees, which I've marked right here in the central angle. A, what is the measure of arc, and I know it's an arc because of that little arc notation, what is the measure of arc ACB, which is the minor arc? Well, remember the relationship is the same, so that would be 160 degrees. B, what is the measure of arc ADB? Well, that's back here, and that's the major arc. In order to find the major arc, we have to think that a circle is 360 degrees. So if we have covered this much of the circle with 160, we need to figure out what this much of the circle is. So all we need to do is take 360 less 160 degrees to let us know that the angle here is 200 and therefore the arc ADB is also 200 degrees. In C, it says make a copy of the sketch showing possible locations of a point X so that the measure of arc AX is 90 degrees. Well, here's A, and we want to make a mark X somewhere from A so that we have an arc measure of 90 degrees. Well, remember that a diameter, which is the longest chord, breaks a circle into 180 degrees. If we break that in half again, X could potentially be here where the D is, or X could be on the other side about right here. So either this diagram or this diagram would work. Let's go ahead and look at a proof for our next theorem. Here it is. By definition, two arcs have the same measure if and only if their central angles are congruent. So what that's saying is if this arc here is congruent to this arc here, those are both central angles, then the two arcs, this one, AB, has to be congruent to this one, CD. So we're going to look at some proofs to prove that that's true. So we can use that to solve problems. All right, suppose AB equals CD. We'll go ahead and mark that. And notice what we're marking. There is no arc over here or angle, so we're talking about the chords AB equals CD. We want to prove that the measure of angle AOB 
So this interior central angle is equal to the measure of this one, COD, and that the measure of arc AB would then be equal to the measure of arc CD. Pause the video and think about this for a minute. Think about how you could prove that these angles are congruent, and you may want to think about your triangle congruent shortcuts to help you. Okay, so hopefully at this point you thought about it and you recognize that in this diagram we have a lot of radii. And if we mark all the radii, we can say that this side and this side and this side and this side are all congruent to each other because they're all radii. So what do we have? We have three sides that are congruent to three sides in our other triangle. So we know that by the triangle shortcut side, 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 we can then say that the triangles are congruent and so corresponding parts of congruent triangles are going to be congruent. Therefore, we now know that the two interior central angles, COD and AOB, are equal. All right, let's look at our second proof. Suppose that the measure of arc AB, so now let's erase and start over. The measure of arc AB, so that's this arc here, is equal to the measure of arc CD, this arc here. We want to prove that AB, so this chord, is congruent to this chord CD. Once again, think about this for a second and see what you can come up with. Okay, well hopefully you are looking at things that are congruent in your two triangles. Well, if this arc is congruent to this arc, then we know that this central angle is congruent to this central angle. And we still have all these radii which are also congruent. So what do we have? We have a side congruent to a side, an angle congruent to an angle, and another side congruent to the other side. So we can call that side angle side. And if we have side angle side, our triangles are congruent. Therefore, we can say that corresponding parts of congruent triangles will be congruent. And therefore, we can pro then prove that AB is equal to CD. Now we can truly say that our definition is true, that two arcs that have the same measure um, will have the same measure if and only if their central angles are congruent. For our next slide, we are going to Prove another theorem by constructing the center of a circle. For our first step, what we're going to do is draw a line anywhere on the circle in order to make a chord. In our second step, we are going to take and construct the perpendicular bisector of that chord in order to create a diameter for the circle. So we are making our arcs in order to make points where we can draw a line between the two points. Now notice we're just going to draw the line between the circumference of the circle, so from one side of the circle to the other, to create a diameter. But our two points helped us to connect that line. Finally, we are now going to construct the perpendicular bisector of that diameter to get the center of the circle. And we're doing this the same way we constructed it with the chord. And notice now we have found the center of the circle. So when you think about this construction, this leads us to our final and last theorem. And this theorem is the perpendicular bisector of a chord conjecture. And it states the perpendicular bisector of a chord in a circle passes through the center of the circle. So let's go ahead and write this as a conditional if-then statement. We would say if a perpendicular, a line is perpen if, if a line is the perpendicular bisector of the chord, then it passes through the center of a circle. So that's how we would know that in fact we have a perpendicular bisector. And knowing where the center of the circle is and that the line passes through it will help us to determine if it's a radii or not. Let's look at the converse because this can be useful as well. Remember we're just going to switch the conditional statement with the conclusion. So, if 
a line passes through the center of the circle, then it is, it is the perpendicular bisector of the chord. We are going to use this conjecture to help us solving these last few problems. Let's look at a couple easy ones. We'll look at a couple medium and then finally some difficult problems. So in this first example, if dt is 5, what is tu? Well, we know that because this is the perpendicular bisector, this side and this side are split in half, so that would be 5 as well. Same thing goes with our second example. We can tell by the right angle that this, in fact, is a perpendicular bisector of a chord. So if this portion is 6, then this portion is 6. Same goes with our intercepted arc. This is bisecting our intercepted arc. So if this is 75, then y has to be 75. In this final example, we would treat this the same way. We have a perpendicular bisector, so we know that this 90 degree angle is also going to be equal to this 90 degree angle. We can solve it one of two ways. We can either set 2y plus 1 equal to 90 and solve, or we can set these angles equal to each other. 2y plus 1 is equal to y plus 4. And then we can solve. And in the end, we're left with y equals 3. We can do the same thing with the arcs. Remember that if this is in fact a perpendicular bisector, it's bisecting the arcs as well. So we can set up a relationship between our two arcs and say that they are equal to each other. And then we can solve. And in the end, we end up with x equals 7, just from solving for x. All right, those are three simple examples. Let's look at two little bit more difficult examples. In this case, we know we have a perpendicular bisector because we can see the right angle. And we can see that a triangle forms when we connect the center to the circumference. In fact, it's a right triangle. So if we want to solve for x, all we have to do is Pythagorean theorem. Setting up Pythagorean theorem, we can see that the 15.5 is our hypotenuse, so we just need to make sure that that's our C. So we would get 9.6 squared plus x squared is equal to 15.5 squared. Simplifying that on our calculator and then subtracting, we end up with x squared equals 148.08. We must take the square root in order to solve for x, and we get 12.17. Let's look at our second example. It's virtually the same, except that the numbers are on the other side. But remember our relationships. We know that this is a perpendicular bisector. A bisector, by definition, means it bisects this line into two congruent parts. So if we have 15 here from this part here down, then we know that the other side is also going to be 15. We still have a height of 6, and now we don't know what the hypotenuse is of the triangle. But we can use Pythagorean theorem to solve for this. So setting it up, we have 6 squared plus 15 squared equals x squared. Simplifying in our calculator, adding and then taking the square root, we end up with an x value of 16.16. So notice the common thread here. By having a perpendicular bisector, we create a right angle. And if we connect our center to our circumference, we can create right triangles. And you will see in these last two final examples that sometimes you may have to do that in order to help you solve this problem. In this case, in this problem, it's hard to see what to do. We know that we have a radius between the circumference and the center of 16.4. We need to solve for this value here, this small distance here, which is x. And then we know that half of this chord is 13.6. Doesn't seem like we have enough to solve. But remember what I said. If you can use right triangles to help you, then you can solve this problem. Pause the video, see if you can do it, and then come back and see how we do it together. All right, so what I've done is I have connected the center to the circumference to form a right triangle. And what I know is I know what this distance is because here it's given as 16.4. So 
So we can label this as 16.4. We know what the radius is that's given. We also know that this side was 13.6 because it's congruent to this piece. What we don't know is this little section in here, y. So let's go ahead and solve for y. First thing is set up our Pythagorean theorem and then simplify this in our calculator. 13.6 times 13.6 or 13.6 squared is going to be 184.96. And then 16.4 squared gives us 268.96. When we subtract 184.96 from both sides, we get 84. In order to solve for that y, we need to go ahead and take the square root. And taking the square root of 84 gives us 9.17, or we'll go ahead and round to 9.2. So how does that help us find x? Because what we have found then is this portion here, which is 9.2. Hmm. Well, remember, the distance from the center to the circumference is 16.4. That's given. And now we know that this little piece is 9.2. So if we subtract that, we should be left with what's left, which comes to 7.2. So you can see that problems like this require a little bit more thought and creativity in how you solve them. Let's look at our last problem. In this problem, we have the same situation. We need to solve for this little segment. But this time it's a little bit easier because the right triangle is drawn in for you. We just have to make sure that we are pulling the right numbers from where we need to. Well, the whole diameter in this case is 22.4. Remember that our radius is half the diameter, so the hypotenuse of this triangle is going to be 11.2. In this case, we have two out of three sides, so we can use Pythagorean theorem, and once again, we'll call this y. Simplifying our Pythagorean theorem, we end up with y squared equals 48, and all we have to do is take the square root, and we end up with y is equal to 6.9, we'll say. Now all we have to do is once again think about what we have. We know that this section is 6.9. Well, from the center to the circumference is the radius, which we know to be 11.2. If we subtract our 6.9, we can find our answer. So that means that x is equal to 4.3 in this example. And that concludes our lesson today on chords, arcs, and central angles. It's definitely a lot to think about, so make sure that you have these examples and these theorems in your notes. You should understand what a chord, an arc, and a central angle are. You should understand the relationship between a central angle and its intercepted arc, and know the relationship created when a radius bisects a chord, and be able to solve problems using that relationship.